everyone! It is your favorite baker back again and today's video is all about answering your baking questions. So over the past couple of months especially, but over the past few years that I've been really baking a lot, I have been asked a lot of different questions. I've had a lot of my own and so hopefully today you will get some answers to some questions and some things you've been curious about as far as baking. So let's get started. Okay, question number one. This is a really good question. What is the difference between a tart and a pie? So the difference between tart and pie visually is the pan that you use. So a tart pan looks like this. It has the fluted edge um, and it's made often like your spring form pans where the bottom comes out and the side comes away. So you get a nice clean edge um, and you don't have to worry about trying to dig it out of these. Your pie, pie dish here, often usually it's deeper. As far as fillings, you can do the same thing in both of them. The real difference between them is in the crust. Your pie crust is actually going to be butter and Crisco based. Um, so it's going to be heavier that way. I use all Crisco in mine, but some people do a mixture of both. Some people use all butter and it's going to have one or two tablespoons of white granulated sugar. Whereas in your tart dough, it's going to have a much lower butter or Crisco content and the sugar that you use is actually powdered sugar. Um, I found it really interesting when I made one of Mary Berry's tart recipes to see that it used very little butter and then I was actually using like three tablespoons of powdered sugar instead of white granulated sugar. But I think that gives the tart dough um, a much lighter feel and it's a little bit trickier to roll out then because it warms up a lot faster and then kind of gets thin and can get really tricky and frustrating. So just make sure it's well chilled when you use it. Whereas your pie dough, I feel like is a bit more forgiving as far as rolling it out. Um, and you can always throw it back in the fridge, roll it out again, and it'll still roll out perfectly. But both are delicious and you can fill them with fruit or jams or chocolate. Either way, I love them. Question number two, um, I get asked this a lot, especially at Christmas time, and that is why are my cookies flat? So it can be super frustrating when you've made the dough and you've put them in, they are puffy and gorgeous in the oven, you take them out and three minutes later, they are completely flat on the pan. And you're like lifting a pancake off of the cookie sheet. I know this, I know that it's frustrating, I have been there. The big thing is how you use your butter and how you treat it. And I know we, we don't want butter to feel bad. <laughs> so the important thing is having your butter at room temperature. This isn't just something that people say to make baking more complicated. No, room temperature butter really does matter. If you are taking it from the fridge and putting it into the microwave to try to soften it or melt it to speed the process because you forgot to leave it out, chances are you're going to melt some of the butter. Um, it's just the nature of what it's like going into a microwave from being cold. It actually changes the makeup of the butter. Melted butter and softened butter react with sugar and eggs differently. And the first step of making any cookie dough is creaming your butter and sugar and then slowly adding your eggs and whipping it until it's light and fluffy and really creamy and adding your other ingredients. When you do this with a melted butter, it doesn't bond to the sugar granules in the same way. So you're actually going to already be starting out with a thinner, flatter version of what you want before you even added your dry ingredients. The second reason that this happens most often is that you haven't chilled your cookie dough. Um, chilling your cookie dough is super important and even if you do it for an hour or up to two hours, depending on what kind it is and how much you're making, it makes all the difference. Popping it in the fridge allows the butter to cool and start to almost solidify again. When you are using it right away and you're scooping it out onto the pan and then putting it in the oven, your butter is already warm, so it's going to hit a hot oven and it's immediately going to start to spread. So throughout those 10 minutes, it is already spread and then sits in there cooking for the next eight, which also gives you a much higher risk of your cookies burning. If you take it from the fridge 
and let it chill about an hour, an hour and a half, like I said, and then put it into the oven. The butter is colder and it's more solidified, so it will slowly start to melt, slowly spread, and cook all at the same time throughout those 10 minutes. And your result is a light, fluffy, golden brown, delicious cookie that will impress your family and friends. Question three. Oh, this is a fun one. Um, this question comes from my friend Amaya. <laughs> She said, you bake so much for other people, you're always making birthday cakes. Do you make your own birthday cake? That is a good question. Um, I have not yet made my own birthday cake. Oftentimes, if I'm celebrating with family, we've either bought one from somewhere or someone in my family makes the cake. Last year, my sister made me a trifle that was layered to look like a taco salad. <laughs> It was delicious and um, she really wins an award there because tacos are like my favorite food. <laughs> so putting that in like a dessert cake form, very excellent. Um, but usually if I'm celebrating with friends, we don't do cake. Um, sometimes we'll go out and do something or uh, we'll go see a movie or something and we just like don't have a big cake in celebration, like as far as like singing and stuff like that. Um, but I will let you know if that changes this year. My birthday is in less than two months. Uh, question number four. This comes from my friend Anna, um, who I met through theater. Anna loves to bake and she makes amazing scones from what I understand. And she said, I love to make scones and I always make an orange glaze to go with them. But my glaze is always too thin, no matter how much I adjust the amount of liquid. So glazes can be tricky because you do want them to be the right consistency, but there are two different forms of glaze that you can use. You could do what would be, I call more of like a donut glaze, so it's going to be thinner to start. Once you put it in or dunk whatever you have in it, it's going to look white and then it's going to spread out and coat the entire thing and drop off and actually be like a clear shine. Or you can do um, more what I think she is looking for, where you would drizzle it or spread it over top where it spreads some but still keeps a bit of its white color so it's a thicker consistency. Glazes can be tricky and I treat them the same way that I do a buttercream. When you're adding liquid, add the tiniest bit at a time and stir often. Once you go too thin and you start adding sugar to try to thicken it, your ratio will get off and it will either change the taste or you'll never get the desired consistency. So after asking her what recipe she uses, she mentioned it uses the zest and the juice of two oranges, two cups of powdered sugar, and two tablespoons of butter. I have made lots of powdered sugar glazes and I have not made any with butter in them. Um, I'm sure that you can, obviously that's the recipe that you have and that it's wonderful, but the easiest way to control that consistency would be removing the butter. Start with just your two cups of powdered sugar, zest your oranges or whatever fruit you wanna use. And then I would actually cut those in half and juice them and mix them in half at a time. So squeeze one half of the orange and then stir that. And stir it for a good minute or two and really get incorporated. Then add the next half and keep going. The longer that you stir it and the more incorporated it gets, the more that the juice or the extract or whatever liquid works with the powdered sugar and the truer consistency you'll really see. If you're looking for, like I said, that donut glaze, you wanna go thin, put it on a cooling rack with something underneath, pour it on top and let it run off. If you're looking for something that's gonna hold its shape a bit more, you wanna be nice and slow with whatever liquid you're using um, so that you get a nice drizzle and it holds some shape and melts into the pastry and bonds with it but doesn't run right off. Question number five, uh, this is a really good one. Um, and I feel like this is like the age old baking question. What is the difference between a cupcake and a muffin? Uh, one of my favorite stand up comedians, Jim Gaffigan says, a muffin is just a bald cupcake. There's a lot of truth in that. <laughs> um, muffins often are made without any kind of topping. They don't have any kind of piped icing on top. The only toppings they get usually are like a streusel topping or um, maybe like a sanding sugar. But the real difference between the two actually comes in their makeup. So the fat that you're going to use is gonna be the big difference. Muffins are often made with vegetable oil and your cupcakes are made with butter. So your two bases are different. And then how you build your ingredients from there is also different. 
with your cupcakes, just like your cookies, you're gonna cream butter and sugar, add eggs, and then your dry ingredients. Um, with the muffins, you're actually going to beat all of your wet ingredients and mix all of your dry ingredients and then combine them together at the same time. Um, overall, muffin mixtures have about half a cup to even a full cup less sugar than your cupcake batter will. So that's why your cake batter will often be thinner, smoother, and sweeter, and your muffin batter will be thicker and a little bit less sweet, which is sometimes why people add a streusel or sugar topping. Um, but fun fact, I have eaten both for breakfast. Not today, but in general. Um, they're both delicious and I could eat them both pretty much any time of day. And what if you did add icing to a muffin? That would be awesome. Okay, <laughs> number six, last question today. Um, this is a really good one and I get asked this a lot um, because I love to make what I call spreadables, so jellies, jams. What is the difference between jelly, jam, preserves, and marmalade? And how do you know? Uh, so that's a really good question. So the difference between them, while they are all made with fruit, is how much of the fruit you're actually using. So jelly is going to be the least amount. So you're actually going to cook your fruit and then drain it, and you're only using the fruit juice with a gelatin to set it. So you're not using any of the actual flesh or skin of the fruit. As far as jam, jam you're using the whole fruit. This is some raspberry jam that I have made, so I do the raspberry, sugar, a little bit of lemon juice, and any spices that you want go in, cook down, and then I actually use a hand mixer and beat that, let it cool, and then it will set naturally. Um, I don't use any gelatin or anything like that. But making any kind of jam, you're going to use the entire piece of the fruit. Oftentimes you're gonna throw it into a food processor or a blender and puree it smooth so that there are no chunks. If you do want chunks like I do, I love my preserves, then like I said, you wanna to go to a preserve. Um, this is a pineapple preserve that I've made. So it's going to be very similar to your jam base except you are not going to do that last step. You're not going to blend it smooth. You're going to leave the chunks of the fruit. So it's the probably easiest thing to make because you put it all in the pot, you boil it down, you thicken it, and then you can can it straight away. You don't need to crush up any of the extra fruit or worry about blending it because you actually want the chunks in there. And then marmalade is different altogether. So marmalade is only made with citrus fruits and it is like your jam base, but actually has pieces of the peel in the mix. So oftentimes people will take the peel and candy it with sugar and ginger and then throw it back into the mix, mix it up and can it that way. So there are chunks in a marmalade, but it's actually the peel or the rind. Um, another question I was asked, just along the same lines is what is the difference between lemon curd and lemon pie filling? Um, the difference, big difference, is cornstarch. Uh, your lemon pie filling will have cornstarch. This is what you would use for a lemon meringue pie. Um, if you are mixing it with like a chocolate filling as well, you'll want something that's thicker and more set and so you're going to want an actual filling. Can be used in um, making tarts as well. If you um, want it to go with delicious scones, muffins, um, different things like that, you actually want a lemon curd. Lemon curd is going to be thinner. It uses all lemon juice, where lemon pie filling uses half lemon juice and half water. And with your lemon curd, there is no cornstarch. So you'll find that the color will be truer and it will definitely be more tart. So that is all the questions that I have answered for today, but I really enjoy doing videos like this. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me. Post those in the comments below. Also, uh, if you haven't already, give me a big thumbs up on this video and be sure to subscribe to my channel. Follow all of the baking do's and don'ts. And yes, I have made some don'ts. And follow my baking journey as well. But until the next time, have a very sweet day.